with respect to pattern recognition, um, data mining, uh, diffusion MRI, um, and he has, a, he has his PhD from University College London um, and is a professor there of imaging sciences since uh, the year 2009. He has numerous publications in computer vision, medical imaging, MRI, and neuroscience. He's an associate editor of the IEEE Translational Medicine Imaging Journal and an editorial board member of NeuroImage. Um, he has, uh, you know, publications all over the place in all kinds of different domains and, and applications of, of imaging. Um, and he is here today invited uh, on behalf of the Ludmer Center for Neuroinformatics and Mental Health, um, one of the sponsors of this seminar series. And it is a great honor to have him here with us today. Thank you so much, Dr. Alexander. And again, I'm sorry for the putting you through such stress to to get <laughs> <laughs> to, to move uh, meetings around and uh, run from one room to another, no doubt. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm just uh, struggling mm -hmm. with the screen share slightly at the moment. I'll be with you shortly. Mm -hmm. We could see your slides, but yes, they were in the uh, the in view uh, the viewer. We could see this the slide panel on the left. Yeah, let me try that again. You see that? you see that now? We can see it, but we see the slides on the left as well. If you click the display, what happens? What happens? Uh, perfect. That's perfect. Just going to swap displays. Oh, OK. Now we, now we see presenter view. Oh, OK. Now that's good. But, OK. Perfect. Please go ahead. OK. So. Oh, uh, Perhaps I could just quickly ask, can we, should we interrupt you in the middle for questions or would you like to keep them for the end? No, feel free to interrupt if you want to. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, perfect. Okay, um, so thanks for the invitation, everybody. And sorry for the slightly delayed start, my fault, gotten the time zones wrong. Um, so I, um, I, I decided I'd go kind of uh, broad and shallow today with my presentation rather than um, rather than narrow and, and deep. Um, so I'm going to talk, my, my title kind of reflects that. So I'm going to talking about model based imaging and image based modeling. And that really covers three specific areas of my work. So I'm going to talk first about uh, my work on microstructure imaging. And I'll talk about a different line of work on disease progression modeling and finish with a, um, a third thing called image quality transfer and all of those kind of fit into different uh, aspects of that, that title. So, so let me start with microstructure imaging. My work on this topic dates back around 15 years ago now. Um, I'll give you a, a brief summary, but if you want more information, you could uh, have a look at this recent review that I wrote with various colleagues. Um, and that talks not only about my work, but summarizes the whole field, at least as it was a few years ago. Um, but my work on this topic, I guess, began with this idea of active acts. And what we set out to do there was to um, produce maps of the axon diameter and density of, of uh, over the living human brain using MRI. Um, and I'll preface this by kind of admitting up front that it doesn't really work, um, but it does sort of get tantalizingly, uh, tantalizingly close. And it, despite that, it, the, the idea kind of illustrates the basic concepts of microstructure imaging quite nicely. So I think, I think it's kind of a good place to, uh, good place to start. Um, so the standard approach in microstructure imaging is to generate a, a simple mathematical model, that's what I've got on the left here, uh, of the tissue of interest and to fit that in each voxel of a set of MR images to obtain parameter maps of various tissue properties. Um, so these are the parameter maps on, on the right here. Um, and the output here is these maps then of axon diameter and density. It's just the, the red yellow overlay here where red shows uh, a, a low value and, and yellow is, is high. Um, so the active acts technique uses diffusion MRI, which uh, as I guess most of you will know, sensitizes the MR signal to the dispersion of water molecules within tissue. Uh, and over a few tens of milliseconds, 
in the diffusion MR experiment, water molecules move a few tens of microns. So it's the cellular architecture of tissue that determines the dispersion pattern of water uh, over that short time. And we can make inferences about the tissue microstructure from any particular dispersion pattern that, that we observe with the diffusion MR experiment. So in active acts then, the parameter maps come from acquiring a set of diffusion weighted images, that's what I've got in the uh, middle panel here, with various different sensitivity settings, so more specifically different B values, gradient orientation, orientations, diffusion times and so on. Uh, and then we fit a simple model reflecting the tissue geometry to the set of intensities that we get in each voxels by concatenating this, this set of, uh, of images. Um, so the model here is a simple geometric representation of white matter. It's this set of parallel, equal sized, impermeable cylinders. And we estimate the size and packing density of these cylinders that best predict the pattern of dispersion of water molecules that corresponds to the measured diffusion signals in a particular uh, voxel. And then the fitted values of that cylinder diameter and packing density turn into the, the values in that, in that voxel of these, uh, of these parametric maps. Uh, so that, that's the, the basic paradigm. Um, Are we and if, interrupt and ask questions right away? Sorry about that. Is, is it okay if we ask questions right away? Yes, feel free. Okay, um, so just uh, out of curiosity, the geometry of these uh, fibers, uh, when you when you done, I'm guessing these are 3D simulations, right? Um, At so, least the one that you showed on the left. Yeah. So with the packing, um, with the packing stuff. Right. So this is really just a kind of uh, an illustration of of the model. So the model is a, a mathematical description, first of all, of what the dispersion of water molecules would be within a, a geometry like that. So that there's some water that's trapped inside these cylinders and there's other water that's outside but in amongst them. So you can derive a, a mathematical expression for what the, how um, the uh, dispersion of water molecules evolves over time in, in, so, in a simple geometry like that. I see. And once I see. you've got that expression, you can then predict what MR signals would correspond to that dispersion pattern for any kind of, uh, any of the parameters describing the model. So the orientation of the fibers, their size and their packing density and diffusivity of the water, that sort of thing. I, I see, uh, sorry, I misunderstood you at the beginning. Okay, that, that makes it clear, thanks. Um, so yeah, so this technique then produces some tantalizing results. So this is a nice map here showing the axon diameter over the corpus callosum in a fixed monkey brain. And we nicely recover here a low, high, low trend from front to back in the corpus callosum, which uh, gets confirmed with histology. This is some uh, EM from the same sample here showing that, you know, you can quite clearly see larger axons present in the middle and not at the two ends. And in fact, this, this low, high, low trend is, a, um, is something that cuts across most mammalian species in the corpus callosum. The neuroscience behind it is that the center of the corpus callosum contains connections that are involved in a lot of sensory motor tasks, things like stereo vision or audition that require rapid communication between the left and right sides of the brain and larger axons carry signals more quickly so they can enable the rapid communication that you need for that sort of cognitive task. Whereas at the, the uh, regions at the ends of the corpus callosum are less involved in those sort of tasks. So uh, the sort of optimal configuration is to have a larger number of smaller axons, which might transmit signals more slowly, but can transmit a larger density or diversity of, uh, of information. So anyway, it's a, it's a trend that, that, that uh, is commonly observed in, in, in mammals. And we recover it nicely here. Um, and then of course, achieving our initial aim of producing such maps in live human subjects is challenging. Um, because the gradient strength in human scanners is much lower uh, and that limits sensitivity. And of course, we have much more limited scan time compared to a post-mortem sample. Um, but nevertheless, we uh, achieve some, you know, some sort of passable results on some human volunteers. We still just about get this low, high, low trend across the corpus callosum repeatable in a 
scan, rescan experiment, and the opposite, low, high, low in fiber density, which again is, is what you'd expect. Um, but, um, you know, the maps are noisy and it requires one and a half hours of, of scan time even to get that. Um, and there are also some issues about the, about the, the model itself. You know, are we really picking up on axon diameter? Because there are other features like a kind of undulation of axons that could cause a similar uh, a similar uh, effect. So really my conclusion at the time was that the technique, though it was interesting, wasn't really ready for usage in clinical research or practice. Um, so uh, so um, we kind of moved on a little bit, but just to say before I talk about things that we moved on to, um, since then, this was done you know, over 10 years ago now, uh, much more powerful scanners have become available, such as the, the Connectome scanners that have much higher uh, gradient strength, and that greatly enhances the sensitivity. This, this graph here uh, is from a, a recent review led by uh, Derek Jones together with various colleagues, um, and the graph shows how the proportion of axons to which diffusion MRI is sensitive increases with the gradient strength. It's the, the red curve here is the, uh, the one to look at. So my original results from active acts used gradient strengths of around 60 millitesla per meter, so down here somewhere. And this graph shows that with that, only around 30% of the, the axonal signal is sensitive to axon diameter. But with the 300 millitesla per meter that's now available in, um, in these uh, connectome scanners, we can increase that to around 70%, which actually makes the idea quite a lot more viable. So there's, there's a lot of activity still looking at these kinds of ideas in places like Cardiff and Boston and Leipzig, where they, uh, where they have these, these, these super scanners. However, as I say, my conclusion at the time was uh, interesting, but let's try and find something that works. And the, but that thought process led to, um, led to the idea of Noddy. Um, so the, the, the idea of Noddy was to, I mean, really what we set out to do with Noddy was to identify the simplest model that we could that captures the main aspects of the, the tissue that influence the, the diffusion MRI signal, still focusing on, on brain tissue. Um, and the model that we devised considers those key influences to be, first of all, the distribution of, uh, of fiber orientations, um, partial volume with CSF, and simply the, the density of fibers. So the, the technique itself is very similar in essence to active ax, but we drop the axon di diameter parameter uh, for which sensitivity is low um, and include instead this uh, orientation dispersion, which is something that strongly uh, very strongly influences the signal. Um, and that, that simple model provides some major advantages for brain mapping over, over, over the state of the art of the time, which was diffusion tensor imaging, um, and, and common derived parameters like fractional anisotropy. Uh, with Noddy, we can break down uh, effects that we observe in fractional anisotropy maps into three distinct components. So uh, orientation dispersion, neurite density and partial volume with CSF. And that means that whereas changes we might observe in a fractional anisotropy map are, are difficult to associate with any specific tissue effect, with noddy parameters, uh, the, the noddy parameters provide much more direct information on what actual change in the tissue leads to a change um, in, in the signal. And this, this is a nice example of how that can enhance both specificity and sensitivity in, in group studies. So this is just an example of a group study using uh, Noddy happens to be looking, looking for effects in white matter in young onset AD. Um, but for specificity on, on the left here, we see a change in fractional anisotropy in this particular location here, for example. Um, but it's hard to associate that with cha that change with a specific change in the tissue. Whereas with Noddy, we see that actually, so that change appears in the neurite density image, shows a reduction in neurite density, but doesn't appear in the orientation dispersion. Um, so, uh, so whereas either of these changes could, ex could have explained the change in, in fractional anisotropy. Um, then 
We also get a gain in, in sensitivity. That's what I'm showing on, on the right here. I've got that the right way around. Yes, sensitivity uh, on the right. So here in this region here, for example, we see no change in the fractional isotropy, but in fact, Noddy detects substantial changes. Uh, there's a, a reduction in the neurite density, which would tend to push the anisotropy down, except that there's a concurrent reduction in the orientation dispersion, which would tend to push the fractional anisotropy up. And so what happens is that those, those two effects both cancel out in the fractional anisotropy and it shows, um, it shows no change at all, the effects cancel. Um, so that, that's Noddy. Uh, various refinements to Noddy have succeeded uh, it in improving and enhancing the, the underlying model and estimation techniques and allowing it to exploit more general uh, acquisition protocols. And if you're interested in using Noddy, it's well worth looking up these uh, these kind of later advances along the same lines. Um, but one perhaps more significant advance that, that does more than refinement, and I would say adds additional capability, is the Sandy model, uh, recently published and led by Marco Palombo, um, which adds one more tissue effect to the, to the Noddy model. And that, that tissue effect is the density of, of neuronal soma, so cell bodies in addition to, to cell processes. Um, and so his work shows nicely that we can estimate that parameter using, uh, if we've got su a sufficient number of high p value measurements. His paper really just gives an early demonstration of that, showing maps from the human brain of both uh, soma density on the left here and fiber density on the right, both of which nicely reflect corresponding histological stains. I mean, the, the focus of his paper is really on a proof of concept using animal data. And this demonstration in humans uses a very expensive acquisition protocol using the strong gradients of the connectome scanner again and very high B values over an hour of acquisition time. Uh, but uh, more recent work on this attempts to get similar maps with a more modest um, acquisition requirement. Uh, so th this is recent work from Noemi Gury, where she achieves a similar set of maps, but from a standard Prisma scanner and about 40 minutes of, of scan time uh, with lower B values of around, uh, around 5,000. And she does that by using a combination of, of, of linear and spherical um, diffusion encodings. And so th this, I think, you know, really offers promise of, uh, of clinical utility, potentially of uh, at least a version of the, the Sandy technique. So let me finish this section with kind of a glimpse into the future of microstructure imaging. One big advance, I think, which is on the horizon is to replace our current simplistic mathematical models uh, with more computational models. Over the years, we've, we've built up quite an array of sophisticated simulation tools. I mean, these were motivated originally by uh, really by validation uh, for validation of, of microstructure imaging techniques. And this, slow, this slide shows some recent advances on that. So on the top here, these are uh, computer generated, but quite realistic configurations of white matter fibers. Uh, and similarly on the, on the bottom here, artificially generated um, dendritic trees attached to a, 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 a neuron. Um, and uh, so th these are all generated by kind of artificial cell growing algorithms. But what that means is, you know, the ability to generate as many configurations as we like, um, as well as corresponding signals from these using by using uh, diffusion simulations within these geometries um, opens up the possibility to combine with modern machine learning to learn much more detailed mappings from MR signals to, uh, to tissue configuration. And that potentially allows us to map much more subtle tissue features, things like axonal tortuosity, uh, you know, potentially tree complexity, branching index, spine density, the, these kinds of these kinds of things. Lots of work to do on this, of course, both in the simulations themselves and also the learning techniques and to figure out precisely what sensitivity we can get. But I, you know, I'm sure some kind of uh, idea along these lines will be the future of, of microstructure imaging. I think the other big horizon is multi-contrast microstructure imaging. All the techniques I showed you up to now have been based entirely on diffusion MRI. But of course, there are other MR contrasts which provide complementary sensitivity to tissue microstructure. 
And I think big gains are possible by combining information across different contrast mechanisms. This is one early example, combining diffusion MRI with susceptibility imaging to get new parameters like a microscopic susceptibility and isotropy, which is, you know, gives us some interesting sensitivity to myelin content. But there are other contributions starting to appear now, such as diffusion and relaxometry and various other combinations you can imagine. Just to illustrate that, I'm gonna, I know we're a predominantly a, a brain group here, but let me depart from the brain just, uh, just briefly. So one nice example I think um, is in prostate cancer, where this same microstructure imaging paradigm works, works quite nicely. The verdict technique is, a, is a, a bit like noddy for cancer really, it uses the simplest possible model that we could think of to capture the main effects in the diffusion signal from, from cancer tissue. It's been, um, I'm not gonna go into a great deal of detail, but it, it proves very effective in, in prostate cancer detection and classification. Um, and results of a recent clinical trial reported in this radiology paper show that it's really the first non-invasive technique to be able to inform significantly on the kind of key clinical decision in prostate cancer, which is to differentiate between three plus three, largely benign grade, this is talking about Gleason grades here for those that know about these things, versus the three plus four, which tends to be uh, an aggressive cancer that, that needs treatment um, and helps you then, uh, helps avoid unnecessary, unnecessary biopsy. Um, but very recently, we've kind of combined that original verdict model with, um, with a, a, um, a protocol that adds sensitivity to, to T1 and T2 relaxation parameters. And by, combined, by using a combined model of both diffusion and these reluxometry parameters, we can get um, greater, we get additional maps out of the, the model, which uh, gives greater accuracy in this uh, discrimination of the different cancer grades. And then another example is in the placenta. We started developing microstructure imaging techniques for monitoring the placenta um, during preg pregnancy a few years ago now. And some nice ideas starting to emerge on that. This early work was, again, just using diffusion MRI. But more recently, we've been combining that again with relaxometry to inform simultaneously on both tissue microstructure as well as blood flow and oxygenation. Um, and then so the, the kind of complexity of the underlying acquisition inspired some quite interesting new ways of extracting information by searching here using this uh, inspect technique just accepted in, in media, searching for a, a, a basis of spectral components. That's these um, com, sort of spectra diffusion relax, I think diffusion T2, T2 star actually, diffusion T2 star spectra on the left. So we simultaneously estimate a set of these kind of canonical spectra and their the the sort of relative weights of these spectra in each pixel of the each voxel of, of the image and that what that seems to do quite nicely is to latch on to quite distinct biophysical aspects of the uh, the signal um so anyway you know still lots of interesting activity i think in the world of microstructure imaging and opportunities um, in this area, you know, for example, translating these ideas back into the in, into the brain um, and into other uh, other organs. Okay, that's all I'm going to say about uh, microstructure imaging. So I'll move on to another topic, unless anyone wants to interject with a question at, at that point. This would be a good moment. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, Dr. Alexander, I have a quick question, but perhaps I could save it to the end, but nominally, why is it that when you're fitting naughty or similar models, why do you not inject uh, parameters that you derive, let's say from like diffusion into like naughty because you're fitting it voxel wise? Um, so um, not sure I quite understand the question, but the, I mean, basically what naughty does, so naughty is an entirely diffusion based model so it, you know, it consists really of um, three distinct microstructure parameters, all of which are to do with the, the, the diffusion signal. Is that what you're Could asking? maybe come back to it later, Vlad? Yeah, for sure. 
for okay. sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I just uh, if you want to put questions into the chat, um, I can also repeat them if anybody would like to do so. so go ahead. All right. Um, I'll move on to the next section then, which is uh, disease progression modeling. So this line of work was inspired by a debate that erupted in the neurology community over you know, you know over ten years ago now about the sequence of events that Alzheimer's patients typically experience during the course of the disease. Um, debate was fueled by the emergence of large collections of patient data, such as the ADNI data set around that time, um, and led to various hypothetical models of disease progression, such as these that I'm showing, uh, showing pictures of here, you know, suggesting that uh, early protein imbalances lead to changes in brain morphology, um, and then reduced cognitive performance. Um, however, kind of, you know, insightful and informative as these kinds of hypothetical models are, they, they lack quantitation as they're, they're not informed directly by, uh, by data. But what they did was to inspire various computational people like, like me, and I know various people over there too, um, to devise techniques that could build pictures like these, but that come directly from, from measured data sets. And sort of at first sight, that sounds, you know, almost quite straightforward. You might imagine that you could um, simply find a collection of individuals somewhere near the beginning of this disease timeline and follow them closely through the journey all the way through to, to late terminal stages. And that would give you a picture of the journey that they go through. But in practice, of course, that isn't possible. Um, you know, first of all, we we simply can't, you know, generally can't find people at the beginning of this journey because they, you know, they look uh, perfectly normal. They've got no clinical symptoms. And second, you know, even if we could find a bunch of people here, it's kind of, you know, we can't really expect to make often quite invasive measurements densely for the next 20 or 30 years as they, uh, as they go through this, go through this journey. Um, what we do have, however, is large collections of you know, cross-sectional or short-term longitudinal data for uh, unknown positions along this timeline from people passing through dementia clinics or participating in studies. And so there's kind of a, you know, there's an interesting modeling and learning challenge there, which is to reconstruct pictures like this, but from that kind of heterogeneously sampled and largely cross-sectional data set. And, uh, you know, that, that's really the, the challenge in disease progression modeling. So um, lots of models out there these days, but um, uh, my first attempt at this was a, a technique called the event-based model. Um, and it, it views the disease as a series of events where each event is a particular biomarker of disease, switching from a ostensibly normal level to some uh, detectably abnormal level. Um, I, I'm not gonna pick through the method uh, here. I'm happy to talk about it later. Um, but I'll just show you the kinds of result that it produces to give you a feel for it. Um, so these were some of the first results that we got from the event-based model, looking at two cohorts, a familial Alzheimer's disease cohort and a Huntington's disease cohort. Um, the biomarkers here are simply regional brain volumes measured on structural MRI. So what the model produces then is a list of brain regions ordered by uh, when they first show abnormality in, in their volume. So the, the red green kind of brains here show that timeline where any point in the sequence, the red regions are those that show abnormality or, already, uh, whereas the green ones are the ones that are yet to show, show any change. So time goes from, from left to right here. Um, so the results that, you know, are quite uh, compelling. So we see in Alzheimer's disease early changes in the kind of, uh, you know, temporal lobe and hippocampus, as we might expect and late sparing of the motor strip, for example, whereas we see the opposite in Huntington's disease, Huntington's disease early changes in, in the motor areas, again, as we might expect in a movement disorder, uh, and late sparing of, of memory areas. Um, technique isn't limited to MRI or even to imaging markers. This was uh, one of the first results combining information from multiple types of markers. So. It includes uh, CSF protein measurements in green here, uh, imaging, longitudinal imaging measurements in blue, cross-sectional in uh, orange, and cognitive uh, test scores in, in, in pink, um, but puts them all nicely on, on the same timeline and, and sort of largely really verifies uh, some of those uh, early 
hypothetical models. Um, the other thing that these models then allow us to do is to stratify patients by stage according to this reconstructed timeline. We can fit people back into that model um, and assign each individual uh, uh, a stage. And this is um, an image again from this uh, figure, again from this paper showing that that staging system nicely separates, first of all, controls from Alzheimer's patients, but also separates at-risk patients into those that do and don't progress over, over a short-term timescale. Um, and the simplicity of the event-based models kind of kept it, it popular since then, and it's now seen application in quite a wide range of neurological conditions. There's a bunch of references here uh, to chase up if you're uh, interested. Um, but a, a, a big kind of recent advance from our point of view uh, on the event-based model and similar models, I think, comes from this uh, sustain algorithm, which we um, have been working on for a while, but published eventually a, a couple of years ago now. So what sustain does is to relax the explicit assumption of previous models that all subjects are on the same trajectory. So the algorithm simultaneously estimates a, a set of disease subtypes, uh, each defined by a, a, a temporal trajectory of change rather than a static pattern, um, the trajectory that de defines each subtype and an assignment of each subject to a, a subtype and a stage along the corresponding trajectory. And that way, what it allows us to do is to separate, separate out temporal change from phenotypic heterogeneity, providing you know, a nice uh, mechanism for patient stratification um, and uh, potentially new disease understanding. So again, I'll skip the algorithm itself and just kind of show you uh, what it can do. So this was a, an initial validation result coming from quite, quite a rare situation where we have known subtypes, uh, each of which has a distinct trajectory of, uh, of atrophy accumulation. So um, the validation then uses a data set from a, a genetic frontotemporal dementia cohort and there are three distinct genetic mutations that can lead to frontotemporal uh, dementia, these uh, mutations in these uh, genes here. Um, and each of them has a distinct uh, pattern of atrophy. So um, the way we set up this validation was then was to give the sustain algorithm a data set comprising all three genetic groups uh, without telling it what the, uh, who was in which genetic group and hypothesize that it would identify subtypes associated with each of those uh, mutation groups. And in fact, what we, what we see here is that it's, uh, even though there are, there are three of these groups, sustain actually identifies four distinct subtypes. Um, but what we see is that the first of those subtypes maps strongly to the first mutation group, the GRNs, second to the second mutation group, the MAPTs, and actually it identifies uh, two subtypes that strongly associate with the last group, the C9, uh, C9 orphs, uh, telling us that actually there are two distinct um, subgroups of that mutation group, um, uh, each of which has a, a distinct um, uh, accumulation of atrophy pattern. Um, so armed with that validation, these are results from sporadic Alzheimer's disease where sustain identifies three distinct subtypes from the, the ADNI data set, um, uh, again defined by accumulating atrophy pattern. Um, although there's, so there's no ground truth to compare with this time. Um, but what's nice is that these end stage patterns uh, associated with each of these trajectories nicely correspond to three different pathology deposition patterns that have been anecdotally observed in, in post-mortem dissection. Um, but here, of course, we can wind back the clock on each of these uh, patterns and see um, how that uh, the accumulation over time plays out, and of course use the model on live subjects to assign a uh, a subtype and, st and stage. So you know I think sustain offers real new power for patient stratification, um, potentially helping you know leading to more precise clinical trials and treatment deployment potentially. Um, many more applications starting to emerge now. This was a this is a nice recent study, uh, which uh, you know I know some of you will know about. Um, revealing distinct modes of evolution of the tau pathology in AD from PET imaging. Another nice example in multiple sclerosis, um, where Armin Ashagi here identifies three distinct modes of the neurodegeneration component of MS, 
um, and importantly shows that those subtypes strongly identify subjects who respond to certain treatments which is not true of the the classical subclassifications of MS primary progressive relapsing remitting uh, and so on so I think that that kind of nicely demonstrates the power of these uh, data-driven subtypes and applications emerging even beyond um, neurology for example in respiratory disease and ophthalmology uh, as well so where are we going with this now? Um, well, in addition to evaluating the potential of stratification of these models in drug trials and so on, um, we're keen to use them to further understanding of disease biology. Uh, I know this taps into some of the uh, work that uh, Yasser and co have, have done in the past, um, but this is some early work from Sara Garbarino in a, in a sort of project that I was involved in, showing how we can use these reconstructed timelines to evaluate um, hypotheses on the mechanisms of pathology propagation. So she was um, considering various simple models of propagation over the white matter network. You know, uh, you know do, do we see a, a kind of a creeping prion-like propagation over, over white matter connections or is a model where we simply um, uh, assume that more connected regions are more vulnerable or even the least connected regions are more vulnerable are any of those more likely in particular diseases, given the observation, the, the observed trajectories that we can reconstruct using a, um, a disease, a disease progression model? Um, and th those allow us to uh, things like the EBM and sustain and other models like that allow us to test these um, hypotheses, accounting for temporal change uh, and avoiding confounds of heterogeneity. Um, so I think that that's sort of the line that we're just embarking on in this area now. Okay, um, that's all I was going to say about that. So um, let me feel free to interject at this point if you want to, but uh, otherwise I shall move on to my last topic. Any questions? Okay, I shall uh, press ahead. So last topic is uh, the idea of image quality transfer. Um, this work was inspired by the appearance of various superpowered microstructure scanners, so in particular the Connectome scanner that I, I mentioned earlier. Um, this is a slide from the Human Connectome project, which is really the catalyst for making these, these uh, powerful scanners. Um, and th so this is comparing a diffusion image at the bottom here from what was at the time a, a state-of-the-art clinical scanner with one from not actually the full-blown Connectome scanner, but a, a kind of early prototype of it. Um, and so you can already see that there's a, you know, a quantum leap from the clinical scanner to this uh, uh, super powered scanner. And in fact, there's a, a, a similar quantum leap going from here to what we can actually get now from the, um, from the connectome scanners. So, you know, these images produce some kind of, you know, these scanners produce some amazing images, which is, fant which is fantastic. But of course, they have limited clinical utility because they're they're you know, very expensive, they're hard to come by, they're very high maintenance, they have huge power consumption. Uh, and for all, those, for all those reasons, there's still only four of these scanners in the world. And it's very unlikely that we'll see one in every hospital anytime soon. So the idea of image quality transfer was to use modern machine learning techniques to see if we can estimate giving an image like this from say, a, you know, a, your run of the mill hospital scanner um, to see if we can estimate from that the image we would have got if we transported that patient to one of these centers that has one of these super scanners. So potentially kind of democratizing their capability to a much wider utility. So my, my initial approach to this problem was to use uh, uh, patch regression, very simple patch regression technique. So I assume a set of training data consisting of matched pairs of high quality and corresponding low quality images we can then divide those images just by randomly sampling corresponding high quality and low quality uh, patches so we tend to take a reasonably large patch in the low quality image and try and estimate the corresponding high quality patch at the center of that low quality patch um, and so you can learn that using various regression models once you've learned that mapping it's then straightforward to uh, estimate a high quality image from a low quality image simply by going through uh, patch by patch and uh, running that 
uh, mapping to to get the corresponding patch segment of the uh, the high quality image. And that, that simple idea is pretty effective. So th this this shows a, an example where we're trying to recover this original high quality image from a, a brutally downsampled version version here. Um, if we do uh, standard kind of interpolation to try and get back up to this resolution, you can see that we get these sort of slightly blurred out versions of the the original image. Um, but my, you know, even my kind of fairly simple patch regression approach produces output much closer to the to the original error maps. So in fact, this this version here uses a super simple mapping. It's just a linear transformation, learned linear transformation from low quality patches to high quality patches. And even that simple transformation, given this as input, produces a much closer output to the original uh, image to you know standard interpolation techniques. Um, using a, a non-linear model, this in, in fact was using a, a random forest in place of the, uh, the global linear transformation, um, does uh, substantially improve. You can see that better actually if you look at these uh, error maps, you can see that you get less, you know, reduced, you get reduced errors from the nonlinear transformation compared to the, uh, the linear. Um, and the last thing to notice on this slide, the, in the last column here, is that uh, generalizability is, is quite good. So while these first two results came from a training set that came from the, the same data set, so it didn't actually include this particular image, but was a, a training set of images from the same data set, the Human Connectome Project data set. So it came from similar individuals and with exactly the same um, acquisition protocol. Whereas the images on the, uh, on the right, let me go back up here, were produced from sort of out of sample training, training sets. So the, the, this one here was produced by after training on the HCP lifespan data. So this is a much wider diversity of individuals and uses a, a somewhat different acquisition protocol, but the reconstructed image is almost uh, impossible to distinguish from it's this one down here actually uh, from the one that was you know uh, trained on the 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 within sample data set. And in fact, even if we use a, a very different data set trained on images of um, fixed post mortem monkey brains, so images you know with quite a different structure, uh, we still get you know an, an almost indistinguishable reconstruction of the uh, the original data set. And the reason that works, the general generalizability uh, is good because it's because we use this um, patch regression techniques where we focus on small segments of the image rather than thinking about about global structure. Uh, so um, yeah, in addition to improving visual appearance, uh, the image quality transfer enhancement also helps with quantitative analysis. This is a an example showing how, um, how it can improve tractography. So one of the big motivations for pushing for high image resolution in diffusion imaging is to improve tractography. And it, this is a, a classic example on this slide uh, where we're looking at the four pathways that run from the thalamus up to the hand area of the, uh, the motor cortex. So there are four known distinct pathways that link those, those two regions. But various studies now have shown that uh, you can really only separate those four pathways using tractography if you have something like 1.25 millimeter uh, resolution, isotropic resolution or, or, or better. Um, so here I'm looking at two corresponding images, one with 1.25 millimeter resolution, where we nicely recover these four uh, pathways, and another with 2.5 millimeter resolution where even if we, so if we linearly interpolate up to 1.25 millimeter resolution, we completely fail to recover these four pathways. But if we use this image quality transfer patch regression, we um, nicely recover those four pathways, even from an image which was originally acquired at uh, a 2.5 millimeter resolution. Um, here's a nice demonstration of further potential of this technique to push beyond even the resolution of the high quality images. So here what I've done is to, uh, after learning a mapping from 2.5 millimeter resolution to 1.25, we then sort of make some uh, assumptions about fractal properties of brain images and use the same mapping then to go from 1.25 to 0.625 millimeter resolution and an even 
run it again to go to 0.31 uh, millimeter resolution. And, uh, you know, th this reveals some some quite tantalizing results. You know, these um, sort of white matter tendrils in the cerebellum here start to come into sharp focus. We can see these striations of the corpus callosum, which you can see on various histological images. Kind of impossible to validate, unfortunately, because we can't acquire MR images of the same at the same resolution. But uh, yeah, as I say, sort of uh, tantalizing. Um, so subsequent work on this, uh, all of those results were in my original paper on IQT back in 2017. Um, but lots of work since then on this, in particular by two of my students, Ryu Tano and Stefano Bloomberg, um, who have shown unsurprisingly that deep learning does much better than my original random forest implementation. Uh, and these guys have done a lot of work to refine the network architectures that suit this problem, and also to, to quantify uncertainty um, in, these, um, in these mappings uh, to help sort of highlight areas where these, uh, the, the reconstruction from this kind of technique might be, might be doubtful. And so for example, here's an area of pathology in a particular image, which, which, which does not appear in, in the training set and the, uh, the uncertainty map that came out of uh, reuse version of the image quality transfer nicely highlights this as a, uh, an area of uncertainty. Um, more recently, we've been using these ideas in a different context to transfer the quality of high field MRI to, to low field images. Uh, this slide's showing some results from a, a project I'm running in collaboration with a clinic in Nigeria, where, um, as in many low and middle income countries, they routinely use low field 0.36T permanent magnet system. So it's kind of technology from back from the 1980s, really. But they, they use that because the power infrastructure they have is not sufficient to support modern high field machines, which are just not robust to blackouts and power failures and things. Um, so, you know, but the problem with those low field machines is they produce lower resolution and lower contrast than, uh, than higher field images and so are less good for, for precise clinical decisions. Um, so here we're using image quality transfer to estimate from a, uh, a low field image the image we would have got, uh, so th this is low field images from a clinic in Nigeria, the image we would have got if we'd flown that patient to London and imaged them on a 1.5T or 3T scanner. And I hope you can appreciate, so that these were the original images, these are what you get after the uh, IQT enhancement, so you get, um, the, so that's the middle column of each of these three uh, batches, so we're looking at T1, T2 and, and flare images. So you get a nice enhancement in, in resolution, uh, but also an enhancement in, in, in the contrast. Here's a particular case study here, uh, which is kind of compelling showing how um, some important epileptogenic lesions, which are sort of barely visible at the low field in the original low field images, um, you know, get really, you know, increase quite significantly in conspicuity after this, uh, after this enhancement. So you know, more broadly, I think there's, there's great potential in these ideas. Low field MRIs making a bit of a comeback at the moment with recent emergence of low field portable systems like the Hyperfine mobile device I'm showing here. This is a 0.05T system now on the market. Uh, Siemens also recently announced a low field wide bore system for clinical use. And uh, you know, I think IQT and similar techniques can really help realizing the potential of these kinds of devices. Um, and as well as, you know, my sort of original aim, which was democratizing capabilities of very high end machines. Um, and also, you know, having figured out underlying technologies for these sorts of image to image mapping, I think they help with other issues too. This was a recent bit of work extending the idea to look at cross scanner or cross center harmonization, where we can, you know, try and use them to transform images all into a common, uh, common space and uh, I think you know potentially this offers some traction on that and just finally to loop back to my my first topic of microstructure imaging it potentially offers a, a way to learn directly a mapping from um, MRI signals to underlying histology and tissue microstructure and that's something we've been thinking about recently this is a a an experiment with excised prostates from uh, radical prostatectomy. So people who've got very serious cancers in their prostate, they, they just take them out. Um, and 
this holder here is designed to hold one of those excised prostates. Uh, it's MR compatible, so you can put it into an MR machine, and then it's got grooves where these uh, knives can uh, cut through so that you get a set of histology slices that are uh, very closely aligned with the with the MR slices. And that then supports us trying to learn directly mappings from the MR signals to the, the underlying histology. So kind of still gathering sufficient data to support this, but uh, I think it will be very interesting to see, you know, to what extent we can uh, learn features of the, the of that mapping from MRI to, to histology. Um, so that, that's all I was going to say. I shall uh, stop there, just finish by thanking people that uh, helped with this work and, and gave me money. And um, thank you for listening. Thank you so much. We added a, a really a wonderful tour of uh, uh, exciting research. So some questions for or comments for, for Dr. Alexander. You can put them in the in the chat if you if you prefer, or of course you can also turn on your microphone and and ask a question directly. I have a, an immediate salient question about the IQT uh, deep yeah. learning implementation. Just going to move the sorry. Just going to rearrange some windows here so I can see. You. Uh, okay, got it. Hi, go ahead. It's really fascinating stuff. Uh, the you know the upsampling essentially of the images that reveal new things. But as you mentioned, it's hard to validate these things. But what are you using as your training set? Um, so in the so the original work with the looking at those uh, the human connectome project data. Uh, so that that was that was the training set was human connectome project, uh, and actually the way the way that we've the way that we did it, and actually we, we kind of tended to stick with this is rather than acquiring two separate images, you know, one low quality and and one high quality, we just start with the high quality image and kind of simulate a decimation process to approximate the the low quality equivalent. And actually that, that tends to work better, although you, know, you sacrifice a little bit of realism, but you avoid all sorts of complications of, I mean, the, the, the key complication actually is just simple alignment. It's very difficult to get, if you acquire two images uh, separately to get the alignment good enough that you don't, that it doesn't end up confounding uh, learning that mapping. So what we've almost invariably done is to simulate the low quality images from, from the high quality ones. There's a couple of questions from Anmar Kadra. Anmar, go ahead. Um, so a very interesting talk. Um, I have, uh, let's start with my naive question for the second part. You showed that this, um, uh, this sort of uh, dynamic data for biomarkers uh, for uh, Alzheimer and also for Huntington disease. Mm. Um, uh, so you're seeing the progression of this over time. How about uh, these, uh, uh, other diseases where, like, for, um, I'm just thinking about, let's say, uh, autism, where uh, some patients basically get treatments. So mm -hmm. is it possible to see how these, how, if these weird treatments are actually working, if there are actually any change in these biomarkers, et cetera? Yeah, so uh, it's, um, yeah, so you, you, you noticed uh, uh, very well that we, you know, we focused on diseases where there basically are no treatments. <laughs> and in some ways, that, that makes the, the modeling easier because we don't have to account for that sort of, you know, the, the influence of those, uh, of those treatments. And I think, you know, so there are simple things you can do, which is to separate um, data sets into treated and non-treated groups and then use those models separately on those, those two groups. And you could see, you know, use that to look at differences in those, uh, in those trajectories. But it, um, it would be nice and to, to kind of, embed that I think in, in the models themselves and we haven't really done that up, up to now but it is yeah it's something that we've been thinking about a bit how, how you might do that. Okay um, so the other question is uh, more related to the first part of um, uh, your talk uh, and it's actually uh, the same question that I asked right when you started your talk uh, yeah. but then I realized that I misunderstood your slide but uh, then you actually came and brought it up again uh, looking at this, uh, these packing simulations that you had shown. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so so um, uh, in these simulations, I'm guessing that you're taking uh, these myelin, uh, you know, the thickness of myelin sheath into consideration, the, uh, the length of the node, the internodes, the, uh, 
density of the uh, of the nodes, etc., into these simulations, or uh, is that something um, that is yeah, not included in there? It doesn't go quite that far at the moment. Actually, let me just get back mm -hmm. to that simulation. You can still see this, uh, I assume. Yes, that's the one that I'm thinking. Yeah. About. So, so if you look at this, it, it so th this particular white matter simulation here, um, mm -hmm. it don't, yeah, it doesn't quite go to the level of detail you described. It, it does have uh, a sort of notion of mile in thickness. You can see this. This is the sort of cross section of that of this um, mm -hmm. 3D structure here. So you can see that the boundaries of the individual fibers yeah. have a certain thickness. So it, it's kind of it is emulating that. You know, the the mile in sheath. But it doesn't have things like nodes of Rambier or, you know, the kind of spiral structure of the, uh, of the myelin or anything right, like that. I see. Uh, so, so here, are, are these simulations guided by uh, at least uh, in, uh, the data in terms of the distributions of these, uh, of the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the diameter of the, of the fibers or uh, the, you know, any data that could guide actually at least these simulations? To some extent, yeah. So they um, basically the way it works is that you predefine a, a distribution of axon diameters mm -hmm. and a distribution of orientations. Uh, so you, you tell it, you know, I, I want a simulation that uh, where I've got a kind of tangle of axon fibers that have this distribution of diameters and this distribution of orientations, and it will then grow you know, as a structure that, that uh, at least approximates those specifications. Okay, all right. Okay, thank you. Thanks. I, uh, yeah, I wanted to follow up actually with Anmar's first question, you know, in terms of responding to treatment. It would yeah. be ideal to have longitudinal data. Is that something yeah. that's going to be coming more available? Um, do you, are there yeah. questions in progress? Yeah, I guess so. You know, so there are things like, um, you know, uh, projects like the UK Biobanks, the one that's familiar to me because it's it's local, um, where you know they so they're acquiring data from, you know, ultimately a hundred thousand uh, individuals, and, and we'll be following them longitudinally, and mm -hmm. they all start at the age of forty or so, and and so some you know significant number of those people will be developing various diseases and some of them will be undergoing different treatments and so on. So I think, you know, that kind of activity, you know, to, you know, gives us the potential to, uh, to do that kind of modeling. And then, uh, you know, there, there are more um, disease specific cohorts that people are following longitudinally and I, inevitably that data will start to appear, I think over the next uh, decade or so. So yeah, that's, you know, definitely potential for that kind of modeling. Yeah. Yeah, because that will really make it possible to start uh, addressing treatment effect and separating yeah. cross-sectional, yeah. So the, the, um, the re I kind of very briefly skipped over a result from MS where, of course, you know, there are um, disease modifying treatments. And um, mm -hmm. so, you know, to some extent, we started looking at it there, but, you know, I must admit I was done in a, a fairly simplistic way, but nevertheless, you know, actually it's you know, quite a compelling result here showing that one of those um you know one of those subtypes basically had no response to this particular treatment whereas the other two had a significant response mm. thank you um other questions i do have a question yes okay um, I was wondering if you could explain briefly how you use the fractal properties of the brain to reconstruct a higher <laughs> image resolution. <laughs> yeah. Because um, that interested me. <laughs> yeah. and, well, it was intriguing yeah. at least. Yeah, so I, I wouldn't say I, I use the fractal properties of the brain. I, I, what I meant to say was I, I sort of assume some fractal nature. And so my assumption is that if you can learn a, a, you know, a mapping that takes you from an image, you know, sort of takes you from a, a patch of an image, which is at one point, uh, which is, sorry, at 2.5 millimeter resolution uh, to a patch, which is at double that resolution at 1.25, then yeah, the assumption is that the mapping that would take you from 1.25 to again, halving that resolution is the same mapping. And uh, so that in, in that sense, you know, it, so I'm, I'm assuming it's invariant across 
at least locally, those scales. So fra fractal in, in that sense, in that it's invariant cross scale. Um, oh, I see. Yeah, that, that's all I meant. So I, I didn't really explicitly in, include any sort of fractal model of the brain. It's, uh, it's much simpler than that. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Well then, I think we'll wrap this up. But just before I, I do that, I just want to remind quantitative life sciences students uh, that you're going to be staying and chatting with Dr. Alexander. Um, and uh, after saying that, I would like to thank everybody for attending. And I would also like to uh, express a very warm thanks to Dr. Alexander for a fabulous talk covering a lot of ground. And then provoking a lot of ideas for uh, future future research topics. Um, so thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Again, my apologies on the mix-up for timing. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. My fault. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, I'm just going to say, since we gave you a bit of a panic attack beforehand,